As I mentioned, Padre P was called one of the greatest saints of our time. He was born Francesco Forgioni in 1887. Just to give you a little background, stay with us because we're going to get deeper here in, in meaning of his teachings, but let's give some overview. Uh, he died in 1968, so he's a very modern saint, born in 1887 to some peasant farmers, then died in 1968 on September 23rd. We want to prepare you today to ask for his intercession. When you hear what he's done, you're going to be like, whoa. That's why on September the 23rd, the church remembers him. Now, we said his name was Francesco Forgioni, but we know him as Padre Pio, Saint Padre Pio of Petrelcina. That was the place in Italy, little unknown town where he was from. Now, we know him, as we said, by the religious name Pio, which means what? Pio is the Italian modern version of Pius, like Saint Pius. He was named after Pius V, the, the um, Pope. Pius V. So, a little bit about him. It's an amazing story. Do you know his parents? His parents were illiterate. They could not read, but they memorized all the Gospels. We all can read, or most of us can read, and how many of us have memorized the Gospels? I have a hard enough time remembering a passage, let alone a whole book, let alone all the Gospels. And so this was the key. The family memorized the Gospels. They went to daily mass. And his mother said that when Padre Pio was young, she would see him speaking to Jesus. And so his mother said that he would speak to Jesus, to Mary, and his guardian angel. So don't forget to speak to your guardian angel. Very powerful. In fact, he would send his guardian angel to assist other people's guardian angel. So Padre Pio, send us your guardian angel because that's what he would do. He would send his guardian angel. And so his mom would see him speaking with Jesus, Mary, and his guardian angel. And so from a very young age, he did this, but he was also very sick. So this was Padre Pio. He, at five years old, wanted to be a priest, and he would sleep on a stone pillow. If, how many five-year-olds do you know that, like that? And so he had many ailments. He was a physical wreck. He had arthritis and I mean, he had all kinds of things. So we should never think that we can't accomplish something, even if we are struggling. So he accepted his cross is because it's so close to what we just celebrated. September 14th was exaltation of the cross. You see, next day, September 15th, was Our Lady of Sorrows who stood at the foot of the cross. September 17 is the stigmata of St. Francis, the first person ever to have the stigmata. And what saints also got the stigmata? St. Padre Pio. This is amazing how this all ties together. So he had many spiritual gifts, healing by location, which means he could be in two places at once. Man, would I love that gift. I could be fishing right now. That would be so awesome. Um, levitation. He would rise up. People would see him levitate. In fact, the flying monk, you're going to hear about my favorite all-time saint story outside of St. Faustina is the flying monk. That'll come up at the end here. Prophecy, miracles. He never slept. I'm like, okay, I'm kind of like Padre Pio that way. But then it also said he hardly ever ate. And I'm like, okay, I'm definitely not Padre Pio. He lived on three and a half ounces of food a day. That's not even enough to sustain an infant. He lived off of three and a half ounces of food a day and he weighed 170 pounds. It's not even enough for a baby. And they said that he once lived 20 solid days only on the Eucharist. He had the ability to read souls. So, you know, that's probably why I would be afraid to go to confession to him. You know, well, you sit down and you're like, Father, he's like, ah, you forgot that. <laughs> I was like, uh oh, I wasn't even going to mention that one. So he's a great saint to go to. Now he was ordained in 1910, so he was living at the same time as St. Faustina. This is amazing. He actually was older than St. Faustina, but he lived decades past St. Faustina. St. Faustina died at only 33. And so Padre Pio was much, much, much older. So anyway, he ordained, got ordained in 1910, 
And right after he got the stigmata, what's the stigmata? The bleeding wounds of Jesus. Not anywhere on the body, but where Christ was wounded in the hands, the feet, the side, where the crown was. By 1916, he had entered into the Franciscan friary at San Giovanni Rotundo. This is in Italy. There's a picture of it. Padre Pio is a, a Franciscan friar. And so during 1917 and 1918, Padre Pio briefly served in the Italian army. Now, he wasn't a soldier. He was a medic. Boy, those guys. Man, you ever watch a war documentary? Those medics. God bless them. So anyway, he offered himself as a spiritual victim to end World War I, accepting his suffering if God would bring peace. Interesting, because St. Faustina lived through World War I too. Now, again, he received the wounds of Christ on his body, the stigmata. We'll talk about more about that later. And he had it for 50 years. All right, his reputation for holiness and doing miracles began to attract large crowds. So a lot of people started coming. But now the Vatican, yay, yay, yay. The Vatican stepped in thinking that the friars were gonna benefit from this publicity. So they restricted him. They banned him. Sound familiar? St. Faustina. And who helped St. Faustina? John Paul II. Again, these three saints. So like St. Faustina, uh, 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 Padre Pio was banned. And so the Vatican restricted him. And when asked about this, they're like, Padre Pio, what did you think about being banned? I mean, today, God bless our priests, but you know, we've got this group of priests out there, you know, yelling at the bishops and I'm being banned. And I understand that we should never quiet a priest who's speaking the truth. Never, ever, ever. But when Padre Pio was asked, what do you think about being banned? He said, pray, hope, and don't worry. This is the best example of trust. Trust is mandatory. We don't get to heaven without grace. And Jesus said, grace is the vessel by which, or trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. So he said, work hard, don't worry. So anyway, some church officials denounced Padre Pio and had him banned for public ministry in 1931 just like Faustina. Now in 1931, guess what happened? Jesus is appearing to St. Faustina. This is amazing. So Pius the 11th ended that ban though, just like the Vatican ended the ban on St. Faustina when they found out it was wrong. Hers was from a faulty translation. Guess what? Into Italian, just like Padre Pio. And so the ban was lifted and then later Pius XII encouraged pilgrims to go to his friary. And so people would have to sleep sometimes outdoors in the fields for two weeks just to hear his get their confession. Can you imagine that? We can't even get Catholics to go to confession when the doors open and there's no line at all. I've had some people literally that I know Myself included, that's why I go to confession every week. Jean Paul went every week. No matter what the condition is, I go every week. And we need people to go to the confession. These people would wait two weeks in the field. The only thing worth waiting two weeks in line for is confession. And they people did. So he did great things like he established a hospital. But all the great things he did, he said the greatest thing is prayer and, and, and suffering. Like Faustina, he said, my real mission will begin after my death. Again, the connection with Faustina. When he did uh, get, or excuse me, when he ended up dying, you know the stigmata? We talked about the wounds of Christ and the bleeding wounds where he was crucified, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. They completely disappeared. Completely disappeared without a scar. And when he died, his body was found empty of all blood. He poured himself out. Do you know what he's the patron saint of now? Stress relief. So if you need stress relief, don't turn to the wrong directions. Don't turn to something bad. Turn to Padre Pio. This is good stuff. And he was declared a saint, guess by who? John Paul II. 
those three. Now, I've been mentioning the stigmata. Let's look at the stigmata. What is it? Let's go into detail here. These are marks, including the nail wounds on the feet, the hands, and the side where Jesus was lanced, and the head where the crown of thorns were, and guess where else? Where else does the stigmata appear? I think we all know the hands, the feet, and the side, and the head. Where else? On the back, with the scourging, with tore the flesh off of our Lord. And so the stigmata may be visible or invisible. Believe it or not, there's an invisible stigmata. And they may be permanent, periodic, or temporary. Different saints have gotten them. Saint Rita, one of my favorite saints, she had a single wound right in the middle of her forehead. Now, the church wants to ensure, though, that sometimes these things are not from Satan to cause spiritual frenzy and to lead people astray. So what is a genuine stigmata? If you're getting wounds or you're bleeding, don't necessarily run thinking that it is the stigmata. Now, it might be, but we're going to tell you the difference right now. Okay, a genuine stigmata, the person who gets it must be living a life of heroic virtue enduring physical and moral suffering. You're living in a state of mortal sin, I can promise you, you're not getting the stigmata. A genuine stigmata conforms to the wounds of our Lord. They're not random patterns on the Bible. A genuine stigmata bleeds, especially on the days of the Passion, Good Friday and actually every Friday. A genuine stigmata emits clean and pure blood. It doesn't get pus, it doesn't fester. It's not, it's basically not like those of a pathological nature. Those fester. This is not pathological. The blood flows that comes from a genuine stigmata can be great, huge amounts, but never harms the person. The genuine stigmata cannot be healed through medication. The genuine stigmata appears suddenly Whereas a pathological origin, psychological, or maybe something in the body, appears gradually over time. Genuine stigmatas have been, uh, and this is uh, again from the, the writings of the church, have been surprised, by the stigmatics, if you call them, the people, are usually surprised by it. And they try to conceal it. And they did not pray for it should not be praying, Lord, make me bleed. Here's an actual picture of Padre Pio. This is Padre Pio. So later on September 20th, 1918, while he was making his Thanksgiving after Mass, he got the stigmata on his hands and feet. See how the blood is soaking through his hands? Each day he lost about a cup of blood. But the wounds never, ever closed or festered. There was no pus. They never, ever closed or festered. Also, sometimes there's putrid smell from a real wound. If it festers and gets infected, a sweet odor came instead of the smell of blood and his stigmata wounds. Why? Because he said the Mass so humbly, and he heard confessions for so long.